A week before Kim's 10th birthday, she walked to the corner store with a $5 bill and picked up a jar of ragu for her mom. On her way home, a man she'd never seen before began talking. Hi, he said cheerfully. My name is Dr. Ramsey. I'm a pediatrician. Do you know what a pediatrician is? Kim walked along silently, not replying and fervently hoping he would take that as a sign he should leave her alone. I was just on my way to get some lollipops for the candy jar in my office. What's your name? Thankfully, they were nearing her house, so she ran forward and went inside. Kim didn't know it then, but that was the beginning of a very long and very scary ordeal. It didn't take long after that for Dr. Ramsey to begin showing up. He would drive by nearly every day smiling and waving. Kim told her mom who said maybe it was on his way home from work. But then the phone calls began. Kim's dad asked about the day Dr. Ramsey followed her home and if she talked to him. He said she wasn't in trouble but that she needed to tell him the truth. Kim told him no and he asked if she was sure or if she could be forgetting something. She said no again and he frowned then asked, then how does he know your name? Kim didn't know. It turns out that was not all he knew. He knew her sister's name as well. Neither Kim nor her sister were allowed to answer the phone, and he called several times a day. Then one night, one of Kim's brothers told them that he was telling their parents that he was going to hurt her, and later, her sister. Things got complicated after that. Kim's dad called the police, but as this was before there were any stalking laws, there was not a lot they could do. They told the parents to call back if he tried anything. Kim's dad then called a friend of his who happened to be a cop. For the next month, her dad's friend escorted her to and from school. She couldn't go outside alone anymore. Then one afternoon, all the siblings and their mom were in the kitchen, when all of a sudden one of the brothers saw a glimpse of someone in the garage. Dr. Ramsey came bolting out of it and the brother chased after him. They ran all the way to Cherokee Park where he lost him in the trees. Kim's parents called the police again, but nothing came out of it. The only information they had was a description and a name that was almost certainly fake. A couple weeks later, the family woke up to something horrific happen to their German Shepherd. The cops said there was no evidence it was him and ruled it accidental, but none of them believed that. His phone calls became more informative in the meantime. That night, the dad put in some carpenter nails in the bottom of the French doors until he got a new lock ordered. Her parents had to go to a company event for her dad's work and the older brother was at a skating event so only the three younger ones were home. Suddenly the top of the French door swung inward and in the few milliseconds before the nails in the bottom caused them to snap back, Kim could see his silhouette. The sisters crept down to the brother's room to look. Someone was standing at the back door knocking loudly. What do you want? She said, is this the Mercy residence? I have a pizza for delivery. She scoffed at him, declaring she was not stupid and she was calling the cops. Before they knew it, he left. A short while later, her brother returned home. Kim told him what happened and he walked around the yard watching for him. By now, the family had pretty much given up calling the cops because it never helped. As the younger brother was in the kitchen, he had this sensation that he was being watched. He stepped closer, then closer again until he was right up to the door. There on the other side of the window was Dr. Ramsey smiling back at him. He turned to yell for his older brother, but when he looked back again, he was gone. They went out again to look for him, but didn't see him anywhere. A week later, Kim was at school and the kids were outside on the playground during recess. She was swinging upside down when she saw that familiar blue car cruising by, moving slowly. There he was, smiling and waving. He called her name and Kim ran to the teacher and told her. The school had been told all about him and the teacher took her inside right away and called Kim's mom. That same day, her mom had gotten a call from the school office asking her to verify that Kim's dad was picking her up as he called to say that he was on his way. He wasn't. Not long after that, Kim woke up one night thirsty. 
She went down to the kitchen for a drink and there, sitting alone in the dark, was her dad. On the table was a gun. He was tired of being afraid every time he left for work that something would happen to his kids while he was gone. Kim sat with him for a time, watching, before he sent her back to bed. Then, as suddenly as it began, it was over. He had vanished from their lives. The phone calls, the drive-by and creepy waves, everything. For a long time during and after the Dr. Ramsey incident, she would have a recurring nightmare in which she would wake up to find him standing over her as she slept. It took a long time before Kim felt like a kid again. She still wonders if the wait had ended for her dad when he was waiting in the darkened kitchen that one night. Kim doesn't know, and she's not sure that she wants to. Olivia and her fiancé threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. She hired a caterer and they were expecting 25 friends and family. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in their kitchen. She told him that was fine as long as he finished by 5. He arrived as scheduled at 12pm, but the moment he entered the house, Olivia noticed that he had a disgusting smell. That made her uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for sick prior and young kids. She just made sure he washed his hands and then left them to his own devices, worrying she was just being presumptuous. The entire time, he kept asking her about the seasoning of the food and telling her to taste it. She said, you're the chef, so I trust you. You don't have to keep asking me. Fast forward, he was still there at 545. The guests were arriving, so after two gentle reminders, she flat out told him she needed him completely out by 6 no matter what. He apologized and said there had been a delay because Olivia's oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. She never had a problem with her oven before, but figured he's the professional, so maybe it was a subtle problem? He gets his bags and packs everything up, but suddenly heads towards her bedroom. Olivia's completely taken aback and says, Excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. She tells him she's not comfortable with him going in her room and there's a restroom to do that. But he insisted it will only take a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. Olivia couldn't even get a word out before he went in and felt helpless. At this point, her fiancé had come back home so she explained the situation to him. Confused as to what was going on, he pounds on the door, telling the caterer to come out. The man opens the door, wearing a t-shirt and jeans. Her fiancé said, You shouldn't be in there. You need to leave. The caterer responded and said, Excuse me, but this is not your house. It's not up to you to decide. Yes, actually, it is. My fiancé lives here with me. Suddenly, the caterer goes nuts. He turns to her and screams, You lied to me! Olivia had no clue what he was talking about. He starts yelling about how she led him on and blurting nonsense, calling her disgusting names. He then goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the food out of the refrigerator and onto the floor. Without hesitating, the fiancé and his two brothers forced him to leave the house immediately. Thankfully, the party then went on as planned but Olivia insisted they just order pizza and throw out all the food he made. After partying, they went out late drinking with his brothers and got home at around 3.30 a.m. and passed out in their room. And then, at around 5 a.m., Olivia was woken up to the sound of the door opening. Olivia wakes up her fiancé and whispers, I think someone just came in the house. He said, probably my brother left his wallet or something. Olivia figured she's being paranoid when suddenly a loud crash came from outside the room. He told her to lock herself in the closet and call 911 while he went out and looked around. As she was pulling out her phone, they hear, Olivia! Hello? And she realizes that insane caterer. She went outside and saw the man shirtless and clearly on something. He lunges towards Olivia and her fiancé stops him while she called the police. He tells them the cops have been called and it would be in his best interest for him to get off the property. The caterer says, I have to make sure Olivia's okay. Her fiancé stayed between them while she climbed out the window. He even thought of taking the gun out of the safe. 
The caterer began to destroy their kitchen and when the cops finally came in, they see that he has a knife on him. He didn't obey police's orders to drop his weapon, so they chased him. As he's being let out in handcuffs, he's shouting out how he and Olivia are in love. The police ask to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what they witnessed him do. They went around, but saw nothing. But then, Olivia remembered that he was in her room. She quickly checked and found out that all her panties were gone. They were so freaked out in the aftermath that they replaced all kitchenware and they had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. Olivia was so glad that she decided not to serve the food to the guests, especially her fiance's fragile mother. The caterer sent a letter from prison and thankfully her husband intercepted because she was still recovering from the whole thing. They gave it to the police who helped issue a no contact order. He was sent to three years in prison and thankfully Olivia and her family never saw him again. When I was about six years old, my mom started taking my sister and I to Dr. Daniel's dental office. The dental center was located inside a giant yellow mansion that also doubled as his house. When my sister and I got caught in, my mom followed us into the office until she was told by Dr. Daniels that parents weren't allowed to be with their children as it taught kids independence, to which my mom complied to. Growing up, I had bad anxiety and selective mutism, so the moment we all separated, I cried because I was so scared. Dr. Daniels did not like the crying, so he grabbed me and put his hands over my mouth and nose and shook me and told me to stop crying and scaring the other kids. His hygienist Judy came over and told me if I continued to cry, she would spank me. All I wanted was my mom next to me, but I knew that if I wanted to get out, I just had to act like I was not terrified. After the first appointment, my sister and I told my mom that we were scared of the dentist, but she just took it as me being an anxious child, so we continued to see him. Each visit was just as terrifying. Every time we went to the dentist, Dr. Daniels, or the Tooth Man as he called himself, always had us have heavy dental procedures done. We had sealants done on several baby teeth and plenty of teeth removed, some with his fingers with no regards to pain at all. He would leave us there with the retractor on for about 45 minutes or so before he came to work on our teeth. Sometimes he would eat his lunch while we sat there with our mouth open. Probably one of the worst pains I've ever felt in my life. There was one time in the third grade I was in so much pain waiting I couldn't take it. I sat up on a chair and tried to scream and cry as loud as I could. Dr. Daniels came rushing over angry and he screamed at me for being a big baby and scaring the other kids. I was so sad at myself because I hadn't cried in so long. He then took me back to my dental chair and then pinned me down to the seat in a straitjacket. He put my retractors back on and said that I would have to wait longer because I caused such a scene. Afterwards, my mouth would become so swollen and filled with rashes. It hurt to talk for days. He would often tell my mother I was a difficult patient if I so much as winced at his torture. When I was in seventh grade, I started getting braces, so I went to see an orthodontist. We stopped seeing Dr. Dan and I had a new dentist who was actually nice. I never known that getting your teeth clean didn't have to feel like going through a saw trap. I think my mom took us out of Dr. Dan's practice when the orthodontist looked at our dental records and saw a lot of unnecessary procedures being done on our mouths. Not long ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about our childhood fears and instantly my mind went to the tooth man. Curious, I googled him and to my happiness, the practice was shut down. Also left under his name was a Yelp page that was still up. The page was filled with numerous one-star reviews from former patients that were once abused as kids in his office. Their experiences were so close and some identical as to what I went through. A lot of the procedures Dr. Dan did were just a scam for him to collect money off our parents' insurance. And now that I think about it, he was probably so adamant of us not crying and screaming for help because he didn't want parents to hear and come and see what was going on. 
It's hard not to blame your parents in this situation, but the truth is this man was a swift abuser. For every bruise and swell, he would have dental explanations that would make my parents feel stupid for asking. I don't blame my mom for not believing us, and eventually she did come around. To any parents watching this, if you're ever told to not go in with your child to an appointment, something's definitely not right. In the late 1960s, my great uncle John was traveling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at one point and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one at the station, and other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding woods, there was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. It was winter and getting colder and darker, and just about the time he started worrying about a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked if he was waiting for a train, and when he said he was, she said it wouldn't be along until the following day. She asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her house. He was glad to accept her offer and stay out of the cold. He took his suitcase and they set off together down the dark road into the forest. It was more than an hour away and by the time they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside and the woman lit some oil lamps and warmed some borscht for them. John finished his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. She led him up to the stairs to a tiny room with a window that contained a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her, they said goodnight, and she closed the door. Then, she locked it, leaving him in the dark. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called to her, but she didn't answer and he heard nothing else. Figuring he would deal with it in the morning and that she had probably done it by mistake, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee and got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something he could pee in. He got onto his hands and knees and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that's where the pot would be if there was one. He found the body. John went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way. It was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in the room, he was probably a dead man. But if he broke the window and tried to get out of the way, there was a good chance that the old woman would hear him and come into the room before he could get away. So he did the only thing he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with a blanket. Then he got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps coming slowly up the stairs and then toward the room. The lock clicked and the knob turned slowly. In the gloom, John saw someone moving toward the bed. Then he heard several sickening thuds. The person had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar which then dropped onto the floor right in front of John. There was silence. Then the person went out the room and the door was shut again. John moved from under the bed and took the crowbar and was able to slowly pry the window open. When the window was up, he threw his suitcase out and dove through himself, not caring what was below him, only worried about what was behind. He landed without too much injury and began to run into a field behind the house towards some light in the far distance. It turned out to be a highway with some military and transport trucks on it. And luckily, John was able to get a ride to another village where he could catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what had happened to the authorities, since at that time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance he would have been the one who got into trouble. He just thanked God he had escaped and decided that the next time he traveled to visit relatives, he would take another way. Morgan was heading to this weekly improv show, but his friend, whom he usually went with, was out of town. So he posted an open invite on a university Facebook group. Morgan got exactly one response from this random girl, Alice. She came to the show and they hit it off big time. 
cue the coffee meetups, the Netflix binges, they started dating. Life was pretty good for a while. Then came the first messages. This man Morgan had never met named Eric was sending angry Facebook DMs detailing why Morgan's not a good boyfriend and that he's hurting Alice and how he just doesn't understand her like Eric does. Morgan was a bit annoyed but mostly confused. He talked to Alice about it, but she just hand waved it away. He's a jerk, she said. I don't hang out with him anymore. It wasn't the most satisfying explanation, but aggressively jealous guys aren't exactly an anomaly. So Morgan just blocked him and thought that was the end of it. A few months passed by. Alice had planned to study abroad, so when Morgan came back to school, she was already halfway across the world. It was only a few months, he thought. No big deal. But over those next few months, Morgan would become Facebook acquainted with a myriad of strange individuals. There was Leah. She sent an array of messages justifying Eric's anger, reiterating that Morgan's relationship was unhealthy and toxic, and that Alice and Eric have much better history. She also included a blurry photo of a girl sitting on top and making out with a skinny guy. Both of their faces were obscured, but Leah swore it was Alice and Eric from some time during the summer. There was Nick. His Facebook pic was a guy on a skateboard in front of a sunset. He readily admitted that he had feelings for Alice, but made clear that neither he nor Eric had any right to be upset about her not being with them. He said that Leah and Eric were liars and he tried to set them straight. Relative to the others, he seemed semi-okay, but he let slip a few really bitter sounding messages. There was Hannah. She showed up after Morgan blocked Leah. She claimed to be a childhood friend of Alice. There was Chris. He would send one cryptic message every once in a blue moon. He never replied to any of Morgan's messages. There was Mark. He apologized for the actions of the others. He tried to fill Morgan in on the group's dynamics and history. In the physical absence of Alice, he offered to meet him to talk. They set up a time and place, but he never showed up and Morgan never heard from him again. There was Sarah, there was David, there were so many. This was all spread over a period of time. Morgan usually blocked or stopped hearing from one person before hearing from another. Meanwhile, Alice is extremely difficult to get a hold of. Even when she responds, she's really dismissive of the whole subject. I don't know what to do, she said. And then Morgan gets an accusation. One day Alice sends him the question, who's Mary? Morgan tells her the truth, that he doesn't know who Mary is. She sends screenshots of texts she received from an unknown number. In them, the sender wrote that her name is Mary and that she's in love with Morgan. He told me he loved me, Mary wrote. He slept with me and now he has not called me back. He started to get texts from Mary. She asked why he hadn't called her, if he meant what he said. She said she had seen Morgan on campus, here, there, at this event, at this particular time, and every time she would say a location, he realized that he had actually been at that place at that time. Was he being stalked? Morgan started looking over his shoulder. He didn't know what to do. He had no face and no name to report. He calls Alice and tells her he can't do this anymore. Morgan had no clue what was going on, but he knew somehow that they were all involved and he wanted no part in it. And he cut off all contact with Alice. Then all of a sudden, everything, the messages, the texts, they all stopped. A friend of Morgan realized something soon after. Barely any of Alice's friends had their faces on Facebook. Eric's pic was some photo of a Tumblr blog full of cute nerds. The photo of Chris was an obscure photo of Justin Bieber. The photo of Nick, the skateboarder, was a stock photo. Hannah's photo was art from a book ad. David was apparently a Korean pop singer, and they also noticed something else. All of their photos were created around the same time he met Alice. To this day, Morgan doesn't understand it. Fast forward two years, he gets a text from an unknown number. The number looks familiar, he thinks to himself. And then he realized, it's Alice. The text consists of one word. Sorry, Alice, but let's not meet again.
This past Monday, Susan and her co-workers returned to their hotel from a day of working out in the field. Rebecca and Susan stood outside their rooms. She opened hers and saw someone in the bathroom. Hello? Nobody answered. Her first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there. And then she saw her bag and her clothes in the woman's hand. What are you doing with my stuff? She said. The lady kept mumbling about how her key still worked and that's how she got in. Susan was in shock and the woman was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped the bags and fumbled around with her purse and the white plastic bag. By this time, Rebecca was behind her watching all the insanity unfold. The woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and Susan said, What's in the bag? No, no, it's uh, just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. Susan looked and didn't see anything of hers inside, so she let her leave. She went into her room and it's been ransacked. All of her electronics were still there. Then she went into the bathroom and saw her underwear, her bikini, and clothes shoved into her own bags randomly. Even the passport was shoved in there. Then Susan looked in the drawers and saw that she got into her medication. She ran out the door to go find her. She went down to the laundry room and out to the sides of the hotel and didn't see her anywhere. Susan realized she was never going to find her. So she and her co-worker went to the lobby to tell them what happened and then called the police. They went back up to the room to wait and noticed that there was a metal bat near the bed. But there's also a flashlight on the end. The police got there and took their statements and looked around the room as well. One thing Susan noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink and she pointed it out to the cops but none of them really knew where it came from. They started looking at the door to see if she pried her way in somehow but there was nothing. They just kind of went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front desk was adamant that there's no way that could be. The officer that came called for another because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after Susan and her co-worker's statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. Susan sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as she's on the phone, she's thinking about the drywall in the sink and it still didn't make any sense to her. She goes into the bathroom and looks at the drywall in the mirror close to it. And then it hit her. She got Rebecca to help pull at this mirror on the wall and it turns out it was attached on the top. There was a hole there just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze through. She asked if she could call the cops again to let them know what they just found, and her boss said that there were still two cop cars in the parking lot. They both went back up, looked at the hole, and found a pillow, blankets, cigarettes, clothes, and toothbrushes inside. This woman had been living in the wall behind her mirror for god knows how long. She had access to Susan's room at all times, and the crawl space was just big enough for her to squeeze through. They took pictures of the scene and everyone was mind blown that this was actually real. Unsurprisingly, Susan and Rebecca packed up and left immediately. The hole in the walls were from a renovation and the hotel hadn't properly patched them so they just covered it up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in people's rooms while they were gone. Susan never went back to that hotel. But every time she travels and stays at another, you can bet the first thing she checks are the walls and the mirrors. My brother's girlfriend Amanda was looking for her first apartment when she decided to move out of her parents' house. She and my brother didn't want to move in together since they had only dated for a few months so Amanda opted to search for a roommate online. Browsing Craigslist, she found an ad titled Roommate Wanted, Females Only. This sort of thing was common since the area she was looking in was mostly young professionals. The listing was for a room in a house that was quite cheap compared to the many places listed. 
The occupant listed herself as a 23-year-old student that wasn't comfortable with living with any males. The other roommate would have their own room and attached bathroom. So far, Amanda was into this place. However, the listing only had a single photo from outside the property. Amanda sent an email wanting to meet the occupant and tour the house. Within 30 minutes, she receives an email back with all the details and time to stop by. The girl worked late hours and wanted Amanda to stop by at 8 p.m. When Amanda arrives, there's a handwritten note on the front door saying, Door broken. Use back door. Walking around the house, it looks nice but slightly unkempt. Tall grass, weeds, dusty windows, etc. When she knocks on the back door, an older man opens it. At first, Amanda thinks she has the wrong house, but the man reassures her and says the occupant was out and he was the landlord. The occupant asked him to meet Amanda since she was working late. Alarms start going off, but aren't at red alert yet. First, the guy was clearly in his 40s, unshaven, and looked like he lived in his car. Also, only the kitchen light was on. As they walked around the house, Amanda noticed one huge red flag. No furniture. Nothing. The landlord was polite about answering questions, but seemed irritable to keeping lights on for too long, rushing her around and only letting her look at rooms for a few moments. There was a single room that the landlord wouldn't open, telling her that it was the occupant's room and he didn't want to invade her privacy. As they walked down the hallway, she notices the front door has a plank nailed across it, broken for sure. Amanda's creep meter is starting to ding, so she decides to wrap up the house tour and leave, but tries to be polite. He perks up and states that he forgot to show her the basement. It's recently furnished and would be a great recreation room. So he opens it. The basement is pitch black. He smiles, motions down the stairs, and says, Ladies first. What happens next is nothing more than a stroke of luck. Amanda gets a text just as some random person parks in front of the house. Thinking on her feet, she pretends it's a phone call and answers her phone. Hey, yeah, are you here? I'll come out from around back and let you in. It's great, you have to see it. With a motion of confidence, she excuses herself around the landlord and walks out the back door. The guy just looked at her and he was confused. Once outside, she quickly sprinted to her car and sped out of there. When Amanda got home, she told her mother and my brother everything. Cops were called, they took her statement and went to investigate. The Craigslist post had been removed. The house had been foreclosed over six months earlier and the property had been abandoned. When the police investigated, they found that the closed room the landlord didn't want her to look in was where the man had been staying. There was a pile of old dirty blankets, rotten food, and empty gallon jugs everywhere. The more creepy thing was he had plastered ripped up pages from provocative magazines on all the walls in the room. And the scariest part of this was the basement. The man had tied a piece of fishing twine at about shin level across the stairs about halfway down. The basement was empty except another old pile of blankets, a broom handle wrapped in leather belts, and a small box with a few rows of assorted tapes. Needless to say, Amanda never ended up moving in, and she hopes she never meets that man ever again. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you're new. If you have your own true stories that you would love to share, email me right here and maybe you'll get chosen for a future video. Follow me on all my social media and I will see you in the next video.